So I started doing triathlons after I started running, like I was really excited about it. And my dad and I started doing triathlons together and I would be upset with my body, right? Cause I'd be like, Oh, I just did these triathlons. I'm so fit. But like, I look so gross, right? These are the words that I would say to myself. Um, but a hundred percent of my body crossed that finish line. It wasn't 90% of me, like no part like sat at home and like didn't contribute to what I was doing. Right. And I'm like, a hundred percent of me is always present. Hey fam, I'm Ana Rojas Pasidas and you're doing Life with Lakeisha. I'm living her truth. Welcome to the Living Her Truth podcast, where we have honest conversations about what it means to live a purpose-driven life. I am your host, Lakeisha Wooder from LakeishaWooder.com, the place where women receive the tools necessary to feel seen, heard, and supported while pursuing their purpose. And now every week, you'll learn those same tools through candid and transparent conversations. Anna, thank you so much for saying yes to having this conversation with me today. Yay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm so excited about our about our conversation. You know, I start off every episode with just talking about how I come to know the person I'm talking to. And um, you know, talking to see you, it, it takes me back to the beginning. It takes me back to the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey, which has been like what year was that? Was it 2016? Maybe? I think it was 2016. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was 2016. So um, early on in on my entrepreneurship journey, um, I decided to stop hiding out on social media and like, you know, go and do networking events. And so at my very first networking event that I went out to, um, somebody asked me to be a speaker at their conference. Amanda, shout out to Amanda if you're listening, asked me to be a speaker because she was putting together a conference called Mind, Body, Soul, Houston. And Anna was the keynote speaker who Uh. shut down. who shut it down at the at the conference and Amanda was so excited to have you speak at the event because it was a it's a huge deal because you're huge girl I don't know if you know that <laughs> you're a huge off in these body positivity streets <laughs> I don't know if you know you're a big deal but um But when I heard you speak at the event, I understood why. And so from, you know, that point forward, I just started following you, you know, across social media. And I was just like, yeah, I like her. I like her because you're just so brave and bold with what you do. And I absolutely, and I absolutely love it. So I really want my audience to really, you know, hear your story so they too can live their life <laughs> boldly. Yes. Because that's what that's what we need to do. We need to live boldly. And you're like the perfect person to have that conversation with. So oh, thank you so much. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Being here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you don't need to hear that every once in a while. I'll just like record that and like that's gonna be my alarm in the morning now. It's, that's what I'm gonna wake up to. That's that's the the voice. It out for you, girl. Send me that little snippet. <laughs> Send me a little snippet. <laughs> I sent it to you. <laughs> but um, so okay, so I want to start the conversation by going to the beginning because yes. on your on your blog website, uh, when I was reviewing it, you know, you mentioned like early in your journey that you had a realization. And I'm going to quote you. You said, my realization was that I was allowing a piece of me to hold me back from being 100% free to be me. I was like, that's how I'm going to open up the podcast episode. <laughs> that's how we're going to open it up. Because how many of us women is doing that exact same thing. So if you don't mind, do you, can you give us a backstory um, on how you came to that realization? Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
one one day I was talking to to a friend of mine and I was telling him and I said, you know, like I'm pretty okay with most of my body. Like I'm pretty good. I feel like, you know, I got a good face um, and legs, arms like that I'm pretty okay with. And it's just a stomach of mine after having given birth two times, having to have several surgeries uh, associated with, with the pregnancies. It's just like a mess. There's stretch marks, scars, the skin was super loose. And I was like, if I could just fix that, if I could just have that, like go away, then I would be okay with myself. And like, then I would be able to do all the things that I wanted to do. And so he said to me, cause he's a numbers guy. Right. And he goes, so you're like 90% of the way there, but you're saying like 10% is holding you back. And I don't know, maybe it was because of the numbers. And I was like, man, like if I was given those odds, right. If I was given those odds to say 90%, would you go for it? And I'm like, hell yeah, who wouldn't Right, 90%. Why not? You know? And so that's what I started to do. I started to say to myself, well, maybe I could do it at 90%. But what happened was at the end of the day, you realize that it really wasn't a 90% thing. It was always a hundred percent thing because it was always you, no matter what it was you were doing. So I started doing triathlons after I started running, like I was really excited about it. And my dad and I started doing triathlons together. And I would be upset with my body, right? Because I'd be like, oh, I just did these triathlons. I'm so fit, but like, I look so gross, right? These are the words that I would say to myself. Um, but 100% of my body crossed that finish line. It wasn't 90% of me. Like no part like sat at home and like didn't contribute to what I was doing, right? And I'm like, 100% of me is always present. It's always there. And... I really need to stop segmenting myself. I need to stop thinking of myself as parts. I'm a whole. I'm a whole. I'm not parts. I'm not compromised of parts. Um, and that when you think of how to build anything, you can't build it and you can't work with anything if you're just in parts. So I said, fine, I'm going to embrace the whole. I'm going to say like this whole person, right? And this is internal and external. We talk a lot about the physical but there was a lot of internal struggle too. Was I smart enough? Was I actually um, clever enough? Was I funny enough? Was I all of these things? And it's like, you know what? Maybe it was hitting rock bottom, but I said, I'm just going to go for it because I have nothing else to lose. I already feel like I can't have the life that I want. I can't go to the pool. I, I didn't like just rock a bikini. I can't go run in like a sports bra. And, and I know those, all those things sound super superficial but whatever, it is what it is, right? I can't go have sex with somebody that I don't actually like know who knows the whole backstory about like my body and why it looks like the way that it does. And I have to like make sure that I, that, that they know everything so that they could be like, okay with it. You know, just all this stuff. And I said, you know what? And but I was also divorcing or divorced at that time as well. when all of this was happening. Um, so yeah, I just went for it. And it, <laughs> Turns out <laughs> these lies that we had been making up about ourselves and, and about those realities, it was tied to a lot of other stuff. And until we started addressing all of that other stuff, mm -hmm. you know, people believe, oh, if I can get a tummy tuck or if I can lose 20 pounds or if I can drop five sizes, then that's going to be the thing. And it's never the thing. I mm -hmm. unexpectedly lost a lot of weight um, because I started the triathlons on the training and I healed my, my relationship with food because I really needed to like fuel what I was doing. So I went from a size 10 to a size two. Yeah. And when you see the number, you're like, oh yeah, when I'm a size two, and I didn't even believe it, I went shopping with the same friend. He's a very good friend of mine. And we were trying on clothes and he said to the guy, he's like, can you please go get her a size two? And I was like, bro, why would you ask her to get me a size two? That's like ridiculous. But then I fit into the size two. And I'm like, wow, I am so unaware. I'm so unaware of myself. I've let so many other people tell me about me and like who I am that I need to like pump the brakes and say, I need to, I need to like relearn me. Mm. And that was a, that was like a harsh reality. We're in the middle of an express and me realizing <laughs> that like other people saw me better than I saw myself. And I should be that person. Nobody else should tell me about me better than me. 
Hey family, so real quick, I wanted to pop in and share some exciting news with you. The Living Up Truth podcast has received its first donation, and we are so excited and overjoyed about it. Family, you guys have been showing up, showing out, and just pouring in the support. And we are so overwhelmed, so blessed, and so appreciative of you. And I needed to take a moment to say thank you. Just in case you had no idea that you can support the Living Up Truth podcast through a monetary donation, I want to let you know, yes, you can. All you have to do is go to the show notes of any episode and click on the donate button to give your monetary donation. Whatever God places on your heart to give is exactly what we will receive. And we just thank you for your kindness. Now, back to the conversation. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's, that's how that started. These little simple shifts in thought processes and conversations about wholeness and, um, habits and, you know, who we've given our strengths to, because we gave them away, right? We gave Mm -hmm. it to somebody else to tell us like, here, here's when you can have it. Here's, you know, I'm taking it away from you now. Um, and we gave it away because it was, it was ours to begin with, but yeah, that was the start. That was the start of it all. <laughs> Man, it was so much in what it is that you just said. Because for somebody else, maybe it's not their stomach. Maybe it's another part of their body or just another whatever that is, you know, for, for that person. Whatever that is for you, if you're listening or watching, I need you to substitute stomach for that thing. Mm-hmm. Because like you said, numbers. Like if if I got a 90% on on my test at school, I was in there. And I was good. I was smart. <laughs> yeah. You know, I didn't worry about that 10%. But when it comes to to us and our bodies and how we see ourselves, we don't even look at the 90 as we don't even look at the 90, the 90 at all. We focus on the 10%. Mm-hmm. We focus on that team. And like you said, we don't even realize that it took all of us, the 100% of us, to do whatever it is that we are too scared to do because we're allowing that 10% of us to stop us from truly being free mm-hmm. to live our lives the way that we want to live our lives. Like that, that was just so profound to me because in every other situation 90 percent will be the lick but when it comes to us personally it's not Mm -hmm. it's so crazy it's so crazy and then you say you know because of the 10 percent, i told myself you know i can't wear a bathing suit i can't go to the pool or i can't have you know sex with somebody without giving them the whole backstory so they can feel comfortable or, or understand. But the thing of the matter is, is that I don't like to use the word can't and you just prove why I don't like to use the word can't because it literally stops you for doing something that you don't even know that you can't even do. Like right. it totally takes you out of the race before you can even, you know, get started. So that's the reason why I don't use the word can't. And then it's like, you know, people, we have to be comfortable and firm in who we are. And because when we are, then everybody else is going to automatically fall into fall in line. Mm-hmm. If you show up, you know, showing your belly, which is what, what it is that you do, you know, you don't have a problem with that. Because of, of, of your courage and confidence, people are going to automatically see you as courageous and confident, right? It takes mm-hmm. away the... It, it takes the focus away from the stomach and the stress from us. Like, don't get it twisted. It's going to always be that one or two yeah. that going to have something to say, right? Absolutely. But, but, the, but the whole purpose is, is that we're not going to focus on that one or two. We're not going to fo- focus on that, right? We're going to focus on us and how we feel about our bodies, you know? And, and when you said, <laughs> I'm no longer going to allow somebody else to know me better than me. Like, come on, you guys, that's self-awareness. That's what it is right there. You know, self-awareness, you know, when somebody else says something to you, it doesn't necessarily have to be in a contradictory way. It can be somebody literally helping you to realize what it is that you don't see. Mm-hmm. Cause you were still seeing yourself at a size 10 when your friend was just like, if you don't, please come bring her this, this to me. <laughs> 
sometimes we need somebody to mm -hmm. like shake us for us to get to see what's in front of us. Yes. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a roadblock all the time. It can be something that's positive, something that's good. It can be a blessing that we just are not recognizing yep. because we still have these blinders on. Right. Absolutely. And I, and, you know, and thank you for sharing too, that um, it was internal issues that you needed to, to work on. It wasn't a tummy, a tummy tuck. It wasn't doing an extra 10 miles on a treadmill. You guys don't miss that. It was none of those things, you know? It was her working on what was going on inside of her. Like that's where all of the, the, the boldness and, and being able to show up as 100% herself. Like that's, that's where it came from. So I really hope you guys who were listening and watching that you don't miss that. Cause that is so, that is so key. That's super it's important. So yeah. Key. Mm -hmm. It's super important. You know, on a, in a previous episode, um, in a previous interview that I did, I asked that guest the meaning of living your truth. Like what, like when they heard living, living your truth, what came to mind for them and that particular guest said you know everybody is so busy trying to be unique that they're all being the same mm -hmm. and so that like took me back for a second i had to think on that for a second and i was just like okay i can agree with that because in order to be unique self-acceptance has to start first it has to start with that right in order for you to be unique you have to accept who you are in order for that uniqueness to even like shine through mm -hmm. but but because we don't start with self self-acceptance we look to other people and then we you know we copy what their uniqueness is yes. and we make it our own what are your thoughts on that same um same but probably and but a little bit different okay too. i think that humans have many shared experiences mm -hmm. but because we have so much shame attached to that we don't truthfully experience them and share those experiences and i think it's that it is our community it is our sameness that actually helps move us forward mm -hmm. but in a in an actual realistic way not in a superficial way Right. Like, um, you know, one of the things I thought of when you were talking was a lot of my girlfriends, um, with their hair. Right. And like, they never wanted to chop. They never, but nobody wanted to do the chop and because they didn't want their natural hair to, to, to come through because it was their hair. They were so attached to it. And that's something that I could just not understand. I mean, my hair is what it is. Um, and it, it wasn't attached to all the stigma and things like that. But once I saw one of them do it, all of a sudden I had this other friend say, Oh my God, I've been wanting to do that too. I just have never been brave and bold enough to, to do it. So her living her truth to saying, I am terrified of this, but this is something I've wanted to do and try for such a long time that I'm going to do it. What ended up happening is that I had all these girlfriends, like all of a sudden, like, they're like, we did the big chop too. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, so many of you are just really struggling with your hair. Like really, that was a thing. Um, and it was just wonderful because now did they all start doing the same thing? Yes. Yes, they did. Um, but because one girlfriend decided she was going to live her truth and saying, look, I'm just trying to figure out what's on my head at the end of the day. Like she wasn't trying, she was just like, I don't even know what my own hair looks like. And I was like, damn, that is so profound because how is that to not even know what a piece of you really is, you know? And so when she did that, she inspired so many of my other friends to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then that's sort of like the springboard that they needed to examine other things in their lives. You know, like, okay, well, what else, what else about me do I not really know? Because mm -hmm. I've never been allowed to explore that, that part of me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's a conversation specifically for immigrants, for minorities who kind of, adjusted themselves because they felt that that's what they were supposed to do. But it's like, you know, what would happen? You know, like for me, for example, um, when I pronounce my name, especially my last name, mm -hmm. um, I used to just only say the Rojas. Um, and I would say Rojas, but mm -hmm. it's, it's Rojas. My name is Rojas. I mean, that's, it is what it is. That's how you pronounce it. 
but I know people get very upset because they're like, oh, you know, she's not all people, but see, oh, she's, you know, she's trying to sound all Latina. And I'm like, but I am, but that is literally how you pronounce my, but do you see what I'm saying? Like even pr- people pronouncing their name is not an act of rebellion. It's an act of truth. My name is Ana Rojas Pasidas. Actually, it's much longer than that. I have two other names to throw in there, but I don't do all that. Um, but that's how you, so I, I made a, a cognizant effort to pronounce my name the way it is supposed to be pronounced, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that if, if that makes other people want to pronounce their, the, their name the way it's supposed to be pronounced, it might start looking like, oh, we're just copying. But some of us are so far behind in actually having communal experiences through our authentic selves that maybe then it's like, oh, now I can't do that because if I do it, I'm going to look like I'm just trying to imitate that person. So it's, it's an interesting conversation. It is an interesting thought um, uh, about it. But sometimes some people's truths unleashes the similarities of other people's truths that maybe they were never able or felt confident or secure enough to be able to share. And now you see it and you're just like, oh, that's so cool. Even though to some people it might look like, man, she just can't come up with her own stuff, <laughs> you know, kind of situation. So I'm, yeah, I, I def, like I said, I could definitely could see that, but I, I see it in a potentially other, because there's so much that we just wrapped shame around that we're just starting to unleash mm-hmm. that it, it does inspire other people um, to do that. To do their thing. You know, uh, I like that perspective. That was, that's a, that's a, that's a good perspective. And this is another reason why we shouldn't be like single-minded number one. And this is another reason why we need to walk in our truth because yeah, there are other people tied to our truth. There are other people tied to our purpose and, and our journey. But if we're not, you know, sharing or, or pursuing our own purpose and living in our own truth, then is causing somebody else to stagnate, be stagnant longer than what they have to, longer than what they have to be. You know, I'm going to have to bring another guy on the podcast to, to, uh, to have this conversation about uh, like shaming. Cause you know, as we were talking and then we talked a little bit before too, um, before the podcast actually started. It's so crazy. It's 2020. Mm -hmm. And we as women and women of color, like we are still like shackled Mm -hmm. in a way. We are still shackled. Like we, 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 we're still um, afraid to be expressive with our bodies. We're still afraid to be super okay with our bodies. We're, we're shamed um in a lot of different areas because like even with something as simple as pronouncing your name i wonder if a a man would have had that same thought like would somebody would have said the same thing or or thought the same way if a guy you know whose last name is rojas pronounced it correctly you know but Mm -hmm. but it's like because we're we're women Oh, so what are you trying to, what are you trying to, (laughs) it's like, it's not even like that, you know, it's, it's, this is who I am. So you need to respect who I am, see me for who I am and, you know, and be okay with that. And Mm -hmm. if they're not okay with that, that shouldn't dictate you as an individual with whether or not you're going to be okay with yourself you yeah know? but mm-hmm. for for a lot of us we get you know because there's a lot of us out here who are brave let me just be honest right there's a lot of us Absolutely. out here who are brave but you know we're brave to a certain point because we are mm-hmm. running that roadblock or running to that one we're always talking about coming back to that one that knocks us back a few feet right so we have to build that you know that confidence right back yeah. up Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with building confidence, but it's like, we need to be building on top of it, not rebuilding all the time. <sighs> yes. It's a difference. Playing catch up constantly. Mm-hmm. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Someone have to bring a guy on, a, on the podcast and, um, and, and have that, that conversation because I'm, because I'm, I'm interested. You know, I was uh, someone too who transitioned to natural I did not do the big chop. 
Um, but I, I did it because I thought I was going bald. <laughs> I thought I was going bald. Oh no. Yeah, I thought I was going bald. It was during a time where I was unemployed. So I no longer had the finances to go to, you know, the shop and get my hair done every two weeks. I literally had no idea how to properly take care of my hair. So as long as I was going to the beautician, my hair was always healthy and thriving. But now that I'm unemployed, I'm like, oh my God. So now I'm going bald because I don't know how to do my hair. And so I decided to go natural and wean myself off of the chemicals and I did under the bit chop so I transitioned is what they call where I just mm-hmm. let my hair grow out I did that for 18 months but let me tell you something when I finally cut off those dead ends because I would watch YouTube videos and I would hear people say women say um how freeing it was and I'm like what are we talking about like, I don't even like I don't think it's hair it's not that serious like how can right, I yeah right. But when I did it, I understood what it is they were saying because it was like cutting off those, um, those, those ends. It was like, if I'm going to brace my hair, my natural hair that society is telling me is ugly, because I'm going to just be real. Society is telling me that my hair is ugly. If I can embrace this, my hair, then I can embrace everything else about me. I mm-hmm. have to. I have to. There's just no way that I can embrace my hair and not embrace the color of my skin. It's like how, right. it's like they're both in the same category, if you will. Mm-hmm. You know? So I can totally, I can totally relate to to your friends who actually went through that as well. Yeah, yeah, because it's a it's a it's a whole transition. And once I became natural, it was like I was just really just free to just be who I was mm-hmm. in every aspect of the world. Yeah. (laughs) And that's just so important, you know, because again, at the end of the day, you know, it's a little thing we take for granted, but like I said before, I couldn't imagine not knowing what my hair looked like. Right. Mm -hmm. I had a friend growing. She, she also did not chop. She helped her like flat iron, (laughs) flat iron her hair. And I said, so what is this going to look like? She goes, girl, I have no idea. No idea. I'm, this is the first time in 20 something years that I'm going to actually see like what my hair looks like. And you're just like, wow. Just think about that. Like mm-hmm. imagine having never seen your, your eye color or not ever seeing your skin color. You just have no idea. You have no concept of it at all. And I just, I thought that was just like the wildest thing, but, and that's purposeful, right? That was all part of the systematic racism that was put into place. Yeah. Um, that has lasted generations um, and, and people are still healing from, but it, that's how powerful and impactful it is to not know a hundred percent of yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah. So yeah. Oof. I know girl is, is, is <laughs> it's not even me. It's like not even me and my hair, but like, I just, uh, I just it's something I hadn't realized until I saw all my girlfriends go through it. And I'm like, wow, mm-hmm. I couldn't imagine ever being denied knowing all of me. And that's just, and that's just hair. We're not even going to really go deep into the conversation and talk about right. like, Ooh, girl. Yeah. Uh, Cause that's, that's a whole nother, <laughs> that is a whole nother conversation. Podcast. But yeah. Yeah. That's a whole nother podcast, but yeah. But even that, but even that little bit helped, it just helps. Mm-hmm. You know? uh, even that little bit helps. So Absolutely. hopefully that frees somebody to, for them to like understand all it takes is a little bit, just small changes. It doesn't have to be this, big gigantic change all at one time right you know it's it's like what people say um how do you eat a he- how do you eat elephant small bites one bite at a right. time right sure. so you don't have to tack everything all at once it's just the small changes it's just the small changes and a lot of these small changes people are not necessarily going to are going to see because a lot of these things are internal mm-hmm. a lot yeah. of these oh yeah internal that we have to do absolutely Ugh, we just build it up in our head <laughs> more than yeah. anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. So let's talk about self love for for a second, mm-hmm. um, because I want to go into it because I want to talk about how can someone practice self love without using it as an excuse to downplay like some serious ailment right that can affect their overall physical and mental health like for instance you know um i don't know if it's if it's still a thing now but 
uh, a while there, plus size women were being happy about the fact that, or being comfortable in their own skin. Let me say this, let me watch how I say this. I felt like there was a message of, you know, plus size women um, saying that they they love their bodies, which is a good thing, right? They love their bodies, no matter their size, which is great, but where do we draw the line to say, okay, but there are some health issues that we that needs to be addressed. Yes, love yourself, no matter what, love the skin that you're in, but also take into account that there are some serious health issues or mental you know, ailments that needs to be addressed. And by addressing these doesn't say to the world that you hate yourself or you don't truly mm-hmm. love yourself. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, fat phobia is a, oof, it is a thing that runs rampant within our society. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we're able to just say what it is mm-hmm. and address it, then you're able to really understand what that self-love looks like. And and you're right, like people can live in extremes and those extremes are where it's very, very dangerous. Um, Of course, we want everyone to love themselves and you should, period. Mm -hmm. But if you're engaging in behavior, whichever side, right? Because you can go onto the other eating disorder side and yeah, you, you, people believe you have an aesthetic, um, but it isn't completely unhealthy, right? Those unhealthy habits exist on both sides of the spectrum. We tend to only focus on um, the fat community because they're the ones that are easier and people feel that need to be fixed the most because at least skinny people are skinny, right? At least you're skinny. um, So that's acceptable, but oh my gosh, you're really suffering and you are disorderly eating and you have all these, you have a lot of issues that are also causing as much internal damage as (laughs) extreme obesity. Um, But we're going to focus on the fat people first because to us, they're ugly and unappealing. You're unhealthy, but at least you're appealing. So we're going to just like, that's fine. Let's just focus on the fat people. So um, it, it, it is then like, okay, how are we having a truthful conversation? Is this about a person's health or is this because of fat phobia? Like, which one is it? And I don't think people want to say I'm fat phobic, but I'm like, are you though? Aren't you not? Um, (laughs) And then we can help address those um, eating or emotional physical habits that are stopping people from um, being healthy and, and however you define that, right? Like one of the things when I was doing triathlons, my gosh, people, all shapes and sizes were doing these triathlons, like young, old, skinny, fat. And I'm just like, good for you. Ugh, I, I was slow. I was never really like, I always like was right in the middle. <laughs> I was never going to win a medal. Um, <laughs> But I would just look around and say, wow, look at all these different types of people doing these things. Like, that is incredible. Mm -hmm. And that's when it's like, well, why don't we focus on individual journeys instead of trying to make, I think we're constantly just trying to throw a blanket on everybody and just like, let's let's make a broad statement that applies to all. And I think that's what people don't like about body positivity because it does make a blanket statement and doesn't create any caveat for it. You deserve to feel like you are worthy of love period Mm -hmm. period and that's where that that sentence ends that thought process ends when you start talking about things like self-love then that's when it becomes more nuanced right like hey listen the way you're eating the way you're exercising the way you are not eating the way you're not exercising there's something there that you're not addressing but let's help you. Let's not make it about weight loss or weight gain. Let's make it about addressing the thing that is driving that behavior. Um, and it may well end up being that, hey, you know what? That is your 500 pound life. Um, but you're living it honestly, you're living it wholly. Um, and it's not tied to something that's actually quite harmful to you. Right, because there usually is emotional scarring um, 
I've just been been watching like hoarders <laughs> recently. Oh my god, yeah. And so, but it's the same thing, right? It's yeah, tied to yeah. some sort of mm-hmm. trauma. Mm-hmm. But you can tell someone, listen, clear out your house, mm-hmm. and you can dump everything out of that house, clear it to the studs. Mm-hmm. But if you never address why that person is doing what they're doing, then they're going to go right back to it. That self love hasn't been discovered. It's not there to other people because you're ple- you're pleasing their phobias, right? Like, oh, cool, I lost ten pounds, or I lost, you know, I dropped ten dress sizes, and people are like, oh, good for you, you found it. And it's like, no, I just stopped eating. That's not healthy. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of mental health issues, especially in the U.S., that people just simply don't want to address, but because it's easier to call someone lazy. It's easier to, to say, oh, they become complacent. It's, it's just easier to make blanket statements, right? Mm-hmm. Um, people are poor because they're, they don't know how to work hard. Really? Is that why people are poor? I don't, you know, people are homeless. If people, you know, like understanding the homeless population. Well, if you understood homelessness, um, you wouldn't say the things that you say, but it's easier to believe, right? So it's easy to believe that fat people don't care instead of saying well or extremely anorexic people it's it's both sides i i like to always make sure that i'm addressing both um even though even people who are average size we don't even bother with average size people but those people can be like hurting really bad but we don't worry about them because you know we're just ooh, trying to save everybody's health on <laughs> on on the one side of the scale and saying hey but like how are you right? You're an average size person. Um, how's your health? We don't ask them that question. But yeah, the self-love community and the, the body positive community has caught so much slack because they just embraced everybody. And people are saying, well, yes, but, and it's like, no, let's, let's try to not put a but on it and then see how that actually does change people because they're going shit for the first time. Oh, am I allowed to curse on this? Um, for, for the first time, um, I'm able to just exist and no one's judging me. How does that change people? How much more could we create change if people legitimately believed that no one was tying anything to their self-worth, nothing, no strings were attached. Mm-hmm. That is what would change people because now they'd be able to connect. Now they'd be able to go outside. Now that they would be able to eat a meal. Now they would be able to not obsess over a number on a scale on either side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Um, But as capitalism does, it takes something and creates a market around it. And so then that conversation it turned. So I, I, I give very long winded answers because I just don't feel that it could be summarized so easily. And so, so broadly. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely like how I feel about it. Like I, I believe that powerful change can come if people were able to untie everything to their self-worth so that they can find that self-love. Mm-hmm. But you have to untie everything, everything, education, mm-hmm. marital status, child status, um, education, money, just untie it all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And just you, like, are you able to just you, however you are? Um, and we just, as a society, haven't figured out how to do that. It's like you, but only because, and you, but because, and it's like, well, just, what if we just eliminate the butt? Yeah, I, I I think that we're we're so used to addressing the symptoms and not looking at the at the root cause, mm-hmm. right? We would rather address the system because there's the symptoms because there's money in addressing the symptoms, right? And not necessarily uh, going after the root cause. And mm-hmm. then also, it's easier to just address address the symptoms so we can continue to push the blame on somebody else because in order because once you go after the root cause then that will cause you to like become aware of of how you are a part of the problem yes 
and and you have to take responsibility for your part of the problem yes. and people don't want to take responsibility don't even want to take responsibility over their own thought mm -hmm. process and actions let alone mm -hmm. responsibility of how their actions affect someone else yep so why not just you know put everybody into this one category and we're just going to address the symptoms and not look at individual look at people as individuals mm -hmm. you know because you're right you know those people who are in the middle it's just like oh, okay you're in the middle so you're good at that that type of thing it's like being the middle child i'm not the middle yeah. child, but it's like being the middle <laughs> child mm -hmm. you know people just forget about just forget about you because they're worried about the person that's at this spectrum and the person on this spectrum but what about the person in the middle, the way to solve that is to just look at in everybody individually, yeah. you know, and be okay with that. I think the world would, would be a, a much better place if people were able to just live their lives without being judged or having to worry about what other people are thinking. We Like we can literally end world hunger. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. You just, know, by, it, just by doing that. It, it, <laughs> it comes to like struggles of, of power because I, I'm fascinated by people who are, you know, so concerned with, you know, one thing and I'm going, but wait a minute. Um, if you actually cared, why are we not addressing this issue? Are you mm -hmm. like, wait, that, mm, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but that's difficult because like you said, that means you have to look at where you fall into the problem cycle yeah. uh -huh. and you either started the problem Mm -hmm. You perpetuated the problem. Yep. You enabled the problem, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you were a part of it. Mm -hmm. But people mm -hmm. don't—they don't want to be a part of that conversation. And that's mm -hmm. a—that's it's because it's challenging and it's difficult. Um, because we were also raised raised very much to say, "Well, this is really bad, and you don't want to do this," you know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, I keep coming back to. Um, to sexism or racism, but that, that's the, tr that's, that's the world that I know, but it's just like, and, oh, no, and, you, <laughs> and it's just like, oh, people love to say that they're inclusive and they love all this. And then you, you know, you show up and they're going, oh, ooh. and I'm like, but me, that's me. That's who you've been talking about. These, you know, being inclusive. Here I am. I'm a Latina. I'm a woman. Um, so how is it that you support me just like everybody else? Oh, okay, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, I'm just going to go hang out over here because you're just not doing it. Um, mm -hmm. But when you say it, then it's like, well, my hands are tied or I don't do that. You know, and it's very uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable for people and they're not used to living with that discomfort. So, um, so yeah, so I think that's just what happens. You know, it just gets um, whitewashed and sort of, speak the real deep conversation becomes really superficial really fast which you've definitely seen in like the body positive community mm -hmm. um and it's just so unfortunate because people were finding that peace to be able to make those fundamental changes um which is just it's just unfortunate it's but that's how capitalism works absolutely absolutely let's take a moment to talk to the woman or guy right yeah the guys have have um self-worth issues trauma self-esteem issues mm -hmm. let's talk to the person who uh who has unresolved trauma and self-esteem issues how do they regain their power um and how they view their body so when they show up even though it's their 100 percent person their whole person yeah. <laughs> that shows up how, how do they regain their power so they know in their mind that it's their whole body showing up and it's okay? So I think one of the questions I had to ask myself was, well, who has the power to take this away from me? Mm. Well, who does? Like, who's, who's gonna? Who's, who's, we think, I mean, like, we make up people, we say things like they and them and society and it's like, but fine B -b pick a person who who is the person within society that's going to like physically stop you create these actual boundaries um and that's when you sort of realize there's like a, a group think it's like the mandela effect a little bit right just okay. because the mandela effect mandela? the people collectively believe that something is true even though it's not mm. um and so so going back to power to prevail with the bathing suit, 
you know, I just, you can't wear a bathing suit. You can't, you can't do this. You know, it's just not, you just can't. I'm like, okay, cool. But I'm going to go to the store and literally no one is going to ask for like, let me see you try it on in the dressing room before you buy it. Right? Like, nope, nope. Okay. So I went into, I picked it out, went into the dressing room, tried it on, went, ugh, but okay, I'm going to buy it anyway. Got to the cash register. Cash register wasn't like, can I see your like bikini buying permit? Um, she just rang it up and was like, okay, moving on. Right. So then you have it and then you're like, okay, I'm going to go to the beach. And like, no one's like standing there with like a velvet rope saying, you, you, you know, you need to go home. Yes, you can come, <laughs> you know, like there's nobody there. There's no one patrolling the beach mm-hmm. to say, oh, sorry, I don't know how you got through, but we're, we need you to go to like the, the ugly section over here. Um, you know, there's no compartmentalizing of mm-hmm. any of these things. And, and again, I, I know it sounds super superficial, but whatever it is, you've created in your mind 90% of the time. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. these barriers that don't actually exist. And so that's what I mean by that power, right? So like, who is I giving my power away in all of these scenarios? Like made up people, somebody that was like going to tell me that I could, going to tell me that I couldn't. So it's like, fine, tell me who the actual people are. And okay, so let's say we find actual people, right? Let's say you go to the beach and someone like literally walks up to you and is like, you are disgusting. You shouldn't be on here. Fine. Let's look at that. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? One person. There's eight, well, almost, we're one. almost, we're almost at 8 billion people. So I always look at what the anomalies are, right? Statistically speaking, look at the statistical anomalies. You've got what? I mean, I used to live in South Florida. So you got what, like a thousand people on the beach and one person decided to come up to you. That means 999 people couldn't give two, like, two thoughts about like what you're doing and da, 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 da. And their thoughts don't count. Thoughts don't count. We give thoughts count, but they shouldn't. Well, they were, they've been staring at me. They gave me a look and they did. Okay, fine. Let's say 10 people do that. You still have 990 other people mm-hmm. that are just not paying attention. They just don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I really got into numbers and I, cause I, I took stats in, in college and I think that was very helpful to me to kind of like create like a reality based on reality, not just one that I had made up in my mind. So even with intimacy, right? Like I would go out, we'd go out dates or clubs or, you know, whatever. And I'm like, well, what if this person like is like, ill gross. Like, I don't even want to touch you. Okay. That might happen. I suppose that's what you believe is going to happen. Cause those fears that you come up with in your mind are huge but do they actually happen? And yeah, they might, but like one out of 10, you'd play those odds. It goes back to like playing those odds and like looking at those numbers. So when someone, um, I had a a male follower. Um, I love this example. He is, he is, um, he's a larger size man and he loves cosplay. Like he just loves it. He loves dressing up, Okay. but he would just always be so embarrassed and he would, so he would never want to do it like in a public place. Um, right. Because it's a lot of latex and <laughs> a lot of suits. So one of the things that he did was, um, so he dressed up as Maui from, from, uh, what is the name of that movie? I wasn't even like a huge fan and people are like, Oh, I'm out. But Moana, Moana, Moana. And he's dressed up like Maui. He's actually Hawaiian too. So it was perfect. And he said, Oh my gosh, Anna, all these people started like coming up to me and they wanted to take pictures with me and they wanted to, cause they were embracing him because he had just embraced being Maui. And it's not because he looked like, um, Dwayne Johnson, you know, like he wasn't the rock. Uh, he was just, you know, this big lovable guy from Hawaii that wanted to be Maui. Um, <laughs> but that gave him the courage to try other costumes too, whether it was Spider-Man or all mm-hmm. this other stuff, because mm-hmm. When people are being their authentic self, there's just something magical about it. People are drawn to it. Um, and so when someone has a fear, I always tell them, like, what truth is that based on? Mm. Like, where, where, is the, where is the truth? And you cannot use words like they, them, their, Cosmo magazine said. Mm-hmm. I, need, I need real proof. And that's something that we've never been given, but we believe this truth, right? That's again, going back to that, that Mandela effect of 
we believe these things to be true. Um, but there's nothing actually that really supports it. Right. We hear the, we hear the words, especially like in those ads, a lot of times like, Oh, you know, beach season is coming. You don't want to get caught on the beach, you know, not ready. So you're just like, Oh shoot. Like I can't not be ready. Mm -hmm. then you're just like wait wait a minute like so like what what does happen like what's the like is it like a fine right like it's like speeding ticket I just pay it and then can keep going like what is what is it what is it really um so yeah I always encourage people to say what truth is that fear rooted in um and most people they realize oh it's not (laughs) is uh... that Mm-mm. it's not mm-hmm. and then they and then they lose you know uh, they miss the fact that we're gonna, we're gonna continue with your your beach analogy you know they they overlook the fact that were you beach ready last year no and you went to the beach anyway anyway right yes did you have the time yes so if you're not beach ready this year then it's okay right nothing happened to you the last time Besides you just going and just having a great time, going back to that, that one, right. That gets into our head and completely throws us, completely throws us off. And uh, yeah, I like the fact that you said that we need to define who are they, like, uh, where is this coming from? Get to the root of, of where it is coming from. Cause a lot of times we make things up in our mind and then also it's, uh, somebody else, you know, projecting their fears on us that has been passed down you know, and it's like, when am I going to start like thinking and and feeling and believing for myself and start releasing some of these things. Right. And, and it's just being a hundred percent free to be me. Yeah. Yeah. Like when are we going to, when are we going to start doing that? (laughs) Hopefully today after y'all listen to this. Yes. (laughs) Today's day one hopefully today today is day one and uh, i enjoyed talking to you girlfriend oh anytime you're so awesome you're so awesome before Aww. but before we end the conversation i want yes. you to give us one book or audible recommendation because you know yes. I'm to audible give us one book or audible uh, recommendation that has that you've read and listened to that has impacted your life um okay so the book is called the power of habit um, by Charles, I think I'm pronouncing it, Duhigg, Duhigg. Um, and it was so insightful. Mm-hmm. Just going right back to, to all of that. Why, why do I think what I think? Why do I do what I do? Is it really me or is it just a habit that was created and then reinforced mm-hmm. over time? Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just, oof, I think I read that book like three times. And I don't reread books. That's like not my thing to do. But it was just so, it was just so powerful. Um, but yeah, I highly, highly recommend that book to to everybody. I love that. And you guys, it's going to be in the show notes. So look in the show notes for under Audible Recommendations and click on it. Um, that's a really good book because how many of us need to break the monotony of what it is that that we're doing? Because like you said, we're just doing it out of, out of habit. We're doing it because this is all that we, this is all that we know yep. to do. So no point in time does it even cross our mind to even question what it is that we're doing, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and even if we do, don't get it twisted. It doesn't mean that something is wrong with you or that you've wasted time. It just means that it's time for growth and it's time for something different. Yeah. <laughs> It's a part of the evolution. So don't get stuck in that either. But definitely check out the book. I'm gonna have to check it out as well. And so last question. When describing the meaning of living your truth, complete this phrase. Like what is your third word when you hear these two words put together? Self-awareness, purpose, and passion. Ooh, okay. Nobody, I don't think nobody has <laughs> passion yet. Ah, I say passion a lot. So that maybe that's like the word that's always in the forefront of my mind. You are amazing. Have you heard that today? Not today, but thank you. Because <laughs> you, you need to hear it every day. Yeah, it's very helpful. Yes, to hear it every once in a while. I'm not going to lie. It's always, it's always nice. It was awesome talking to you today. 